بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala May the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant And final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh well, Tonight inshallah ta'ala what I wanted to uh, share with you is a story From the many stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran uh, This story is titled The Stone to Victory You'll find out towards the end of the story where that came from and this is the story of Talut and Jalut that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. Just before we begin with this story, we need to understand what is the purpose of a story in the Quran. Uh, within one minute, we answer that Allah Azza wa Jal. He says in Surah Hud, He gives us an explanation and a reason for the purpose and the objective of a story in the Quran. Why is the story mentioned in the Quran? Why, why do we have to know about Talut and Jalut? And why do we have to know about Nuh alayhi salam or Ibrahim alayhi salam? Why? Even in Surah Al-Baqarah at the beginning, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Tilka ummatun qad khalat laha ma kasabat wa lakum ma kasabtum wa la tusaluna amma kanu ya'maloon. In relation, يعني, our relationship with the previous prophets and the previous nations, Allah says those are nations that passed and came. And for them, they'll be held accountable on the day of judgment for the things they did. And you'll be held accountable on the day of judgment for the things you did. And then he said, وَلَا تُسْأَلُونَ عَمَّا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ And you will not be asked about that which they used to do. So if we're not asked about them, why do we have to know their story? Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Hud, He says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, clarifying uh, to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what's the purpose of a story? And he says to him, وَكُلَّ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ That's all. He says, and these are the stories of the prophets and the messengers we narrate unto you. لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ For the only one reason that we keep your heart steadfast on this matter, يعني on this deen. لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ uh, That's it. That is exactly what the purpose of a story is. So in other words, if a story at the end of the day doesn't increase your iman or doesn't increase your steadfastness on this deen or doesn't at least increase some certainty of this deen of Allah and the victory of Allah Azza wa coming in the future and so on then you really didn't benefit anything from a story you may be entertained as much as you want but if you didn't get to the purpose itself then you really lost the entire point of what a story is there for in the Quran they're not only there for the sheer purpose of entertainment even though stories in the Quran are enjoyed and above all, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to enjoy stories. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once, uh, when he's reading in Surah Al-Kahf, like the Surah, inshallah, we read today, uh, you know the story between Musa and Khadr. At the end of it, Al-Khadr, he cannot, يعني, he can no longer hold this impatience of Musa alayhi salam. So he gets frustrated from Musa and he says to him, هَذَا فِرَاقُ بَيْنِ وَبَيْنِكْ سَأُنَبِّيُكَ بِتَأْوِيلِ مَا لَمْ تَسْطَعَ عَلَيْهِ صَبْرًا he said to him, look, that's it. This is the parting between me and you. Sit down. I'm going to explain and give you interpretation of everything I did of those three scenes that you weren't able to have patience with. For Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he read this ayah in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, uh, he said, وَدِدْنَا أَن لَوْ قَدْ صَبَرَ مُوسَى I wish that Musa alayhi salam had remained patient so Allah Azza wa Jal can give us more and more of the story of Al Musa al Khadr and some more of the knowledge of Al Khadr uh, and Musa alayhi salam. Fa Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enjoyed the stories and that's fine, that's all good. You can enjoy a story that is mentioned in the Quran. That's uh, the culture, that's the environment of a story. Aslan, you cannot mention a story except that you live within the lessons of the story and you live in the climate uh, and in the environment of the story. That's fine. But you need to understand that uh, if you do not take the main objective and the purpose of the story, and that is that it keeps the heart steadfast on this matter, on this deen of Allah, if you don't get that out of the story at the end, then you really lost a lot. 
actually lost everything from what the purpose of a story is and why Allah Azza wa Jal narrates unto us uh, stories in the Quran. Allah, as we move bit by bit in the ayat of the story, this is what we want to reflect on. How is this ayah very concerning for us in our everyday, day-to-day -day life? This is exactly what the story is there for. And you need to understand that these stories, who are the first people to hear these stories? And these stories were an inspiration for the Sahaba before it was for us. For if you really want to understand how do I benefit from a story in the Quran, look at the Sahaba and, and how they responded to this story. And what did they do in their life that, that, uh, that, that basically copied this story? What did they do in their life that they took inspiration from this story and they, uh, and they basically integrated in their daily life? We'll see in this story of Talut and Jalut, there is something that is mentioned in this story that you find in the Quran, Allah tells us about the Sahaba that they did. If I forget, remind me that's at the end, I'll mention it inshallah ta'ala. So this is the story of Talut and Jalut. At the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الْمَلَأِ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مُوسَى إِذْ قَالُوا لِنَبِيِّ اللَّهُ مُبْعَثْ لَنَا مَلِكًا نُقَاتِلْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Just let me roughly translate and then I'll take you to the beginning of where all this begins. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, did you receive the information and the news? He's saying to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the information on the, and the news of the chiefs of Bani Israel. These are the chiefs, yani those that stand around the king or around the prophet, the chiefs of Bani Israel. From a long time after Musa alayhi salam, when they came to a prophet of theirs, and they said to him, appoint for us a king so we can fight fi sabirillah. Where does all this begin? Let me track you all the way back, and we'll start from yani, where we can make sense of all of this. Uh, the story, my brothers and sisters, let's say Musa alayhi salam now, he is rescued, and him and Bani Israel are saved, and Fir'aun and his army just drowned. They're dead. Um, Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel now on the other side. They have never been to the other side. They have no idea what's ahead of them. They're in a desert now. So they've left Egypt and they're on the other side. Yeah, I mean, now they're in Jordan heading towards the Palestine, that right region, in that Sham. So, as they're there, they've got no idea what they're doing in the desert. There's about 600,000 of them. Allah Azza wa Jal, He gives them a cloud that hovers above their heads as a means of shade for them. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَظَلَّلْنَا عَلَيْهِمُ الْغَمَامِ That's their shelter taken care of. They didn't have to make any huts or houses and tents. Then already, no worries. There's a, a cloud that's just going to hover above your head wherever you go. In the day, in the night, wherever it is. Food. What are they going to do for food? It's in the desert. What kind of food is going to grow in the desert? What are you going to eat in the desert? That's taken care of. Anzalna alaykum al manna wa salwa. Allah sends down al man and al salwa. Al salwa is a kind of uh, poultry, chicken. Well, man is a type of sweet. Allah Azza wa Jal would send that down on them fresh every day. They didn't even have to store anything for the next day. Make sure, you know, it's uh, yani intact and that, and then eat it tomorrow. You know, or cook it and reheat a microwave. None of that stuff. Fresh every day, something new is coming. All right, that's food taken care of. Five over about the water. Allah Azza wa Jal, He sends with Bani Israel and Musa alayhi salam uh, a, a boulder, like a rock, a kind of a, a big sized rock, follows them wherever they went. He just walks with them. And whenever they wanted to drink, they'd say, Ya Musa, they'd request from him, give us some water to drink. For he gets his staff, the staff, the same staff that he used to strike the ocean and it opened up, he would strike this boulder with it. انفجرت منه اثنتا عشرة عينا. Twelve springs would gush out of it, and all the tribes, the twelve tribes of Bani Israel, each one of them would go to his own spring and they would drink water, food, shelter, and their clothing. As they grew, their clothes would grow with them. Further, this is a, a riwayah from Bani Israel, but we can mention it, that's fine, because there's nothing in our sharia that contradicts it. So that's with their clothing. For set up in the desert, they had to do nothing. As they're walking, Musa alayhi salam, he turns to his people. Now, oh, Allah has saved us, and Allah has given us, mashallah, these blessings. Now he says to them in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Ya qawm, udkhulu al-arda al-muqaddasat al-lati katab Allah lakum. He said, uh, my people, it's time that we enter the promised lands, Palestine, Jerusalem. 
This is the land Allah has written for you. This is for us. This is for Bani Israel. We got to enter this land. There's, a, there's, there's tyrants in there. These people are called Al-Jabbarin. We got to go in, we got to fight them, and we got to take the land, and that's Allah's pro- commandment for us. And it's written for us. So we got Allah on our side. There's nothing to worry about. Be very careful. Ah, don't get there towards the door and then turn around and run away. Otherwise you become losers in the sight of Allah. Don't do that. So they said to him, قالوا يا موسى إن فيها قوما جبارين. Are you kidding? <laughs> There's a قوما جبارين inside. There are people that are tyrants and physically strong. جبارين يعني من الجبر. Meaning they're, they're, they're physically abusive, oppressive, and they're strong, and their physical character is huge. And just looking at them, you get scared. They said, إِنَّ فِيهَا قَوْمًا جَبَّارِينَ وَإِنَّ لَنَّ نَدْخُلَهَا حَتَّى يَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا No way! We will never enter inside this promised land that Allah wrote for us, that wrote for us until يَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا Until they leave. فَإِنْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا فَإِنَّا دَاخِلُونَ The second they leave and walk out, we'll enter straight away, no problems. So, قَالَ رَجُلَانْ مِنَ الَّذِينَ يَخَافُونَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ أُدْخُلُوا عَلَيْهِمُ الْبَابِ Two people from Bani Israel uh, said, what's wrong with you, Bani Israel? But Allah has told us this land is ours, it's promised, it's for us. Enter, just enter it. And look what they said. فَإِذَا دَخَلْتُمُوهُ فَإِنَّكُمْ غَالِبُونَ Enter, because if you enter, you are going to be victorious. This is Allah's promise. فَإِنَّكُمْ غَالِبُونَ يعني you're going, Don't worry about their size, even if you're just one of you. Don't worry about what you have. You don't even need anything. No weapon, just walk in. Just walk in and Allah Azza wa Jal will place the terror and the fear in their hearts and they'll run away. This is your land, go in. فَإِذَا دَخَلْتُمُوهُ فَإِنَّكُمْ غَالِبُونَ وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Put your trust in Allah and just trust me and go in. Put your trust in Allah and walk in. If again, they're not convinced. They respond back to Musa. And they say, Ya Musa, inna, listen, inna lan nadkhula abadan madamu fiha. They add now abadan. We are not going to enter it at all. فَذَهَبْ أَنْتَ وَرَبُّكَ فَقَاتِلَ إِنَّا هَا هُنَا قَاعِدُونَ So you want to go? Go you and your Lord. We're going to sit right here. We got nothing. You go, you and Allah. We're going to sit right here. This is very rude. Yeah, and in other words, this is how they are rebelling against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command. No iman. Uh, yeah, and basically, no execution of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's law and command. For they sat down and they said, we're not going in. For Musa alayhi salam, what does he have? He complains to Allah. He says, Rabbi, inni la amliku illa nafsi wa akhi. Fafruq baynana wa bayna al-qawm al-fasiqeen. He said, Allah, I got no control. I only have control over myself and my brother. That's it. فَفْرُقْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِقِينَ Distance between us and the rebellious tribe. This Bani Israel, they're rebellious now. They're fasiqeen. They're not listening to your commandment. So make a distance between me and them. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, He reveals down to Musa alayhi salam, قَالَ فَإِنَّهَا مُحَرَّمَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَرْبَعِينَ السَّنَةِ يَتِيهُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَا تَأْسَ عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِقِينَ Right. Is this how they dealt with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandment? No worries. He said to Musa alayhi salam, إِنَّهَا مُحَرَّمَةَ عَلَيْهِمْ That promised land that I guaranteed them they'll enter if they just walk in has become haram on them for 40 years. That's it. They won't enter it. And that land is haram upon Bani Israel for 40 years. What's going to happen in 40 years? يَتِيهُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ That's their punishment. They're going to be lost in the desert. Lost in the desert. 40 years. فَلَا تَأْسَ عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِقِينَ Don't worry about these people. And that's it. Okay. 40 years now. This is, they call it the 40 years that lost in the desert, the exile of Bani Israel. For 40 years, they're lost in the desert. What does that mean? And they'd wake up in the morning. They'd walk kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. They'd sleep. They wake up the next morning. They got no idea where they're going. Walk some more kilometers and they're just literally lost. Someone lost in the desert. Compass, nothing is going to work out now. Not even a GPS, nothing. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment upon them for 40 years. You are going to be lost in the desert. They'll go east, west, uh, north, south, left, right, wherever you go, all you're going to see is a desert for 40 years. Within these 40 years, Musa alayhi salam dies. Alayhi salam, he's dead during that year. Two years after him, 
Harun alayhi salam dies, and Bani Israel, they were commanded that when Musa alayhi salam and Harun pass away, that you make a box and you put inside of this box remnants of Musa and Harun alayhi salam. And when they died, they made a box. It's called a tabut. This is very important. It's going to come in the story later on. A tabut, like a coffin. It's, 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 it's sort of rectangular in shape. And they put inside of it some cloth of Musa, the cloth of Harun. They put in it the, the staff of Musa alayhi salam. They put inside of there a Torah, you know, the, the, yani, the tablets that Musa alayhi salam was given. Uh, and they put in there some other stuff. For this is all inside of there is belongings of Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam. And this is a box. And this box was a miracle. Fihi sakina, Allah says. Within it, there was a tranquility. When Bani Israel would get close to it, they feel at ease and at rest. It was like a good omen. It was a good omen. This box was, was good news for them. طيب. 40 years went by. Why 40 years? Why did Allah punish them for 40 years? And ulama, rahimahumullah, they say, because that generation that defied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandment was no good. They're the same generation that worshipped the calf. No good. So 40 years have to go by for this generation to die and for a new generation to be given birth to. For 40 years go by and a new generation now has been given birth to. These new boys now, these young boys that have grown, some of them 30, 40 years old, it's been 40 years now, but he's still having children. But these children have never worshipped the calf, have never seen that stuff. They've never defied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandment. These people are pure. And those who have worshipped the calf and those who rebelled against Allah's commandment of entering the promised land have all died. And who now is the prophet among them? Yusha ibn Nun alayhi salam. Yusha is the same boy that accompanied Musa alayhi salam on his journey to Al-Khadr. When he learned, remember, qala li fatah, a young boy with him that held the bucket for him that had the half fish cooked in there, whatever it is. Anyway, this young boy now, he's grown. Now he's a prophet. And Allah Azza wa Jal gives him a commandment, take this new generation and enter the promised land. Who's inside the promised land? al Jabbarin. they're still in there. These people, they're called Jabbarin. So he goes and he says to his people, are you ready? They said, yeah, yeah, we're ready. We're ready, we go. We go with you. We go with you and we fight. Let's go. So they, they take their tabut, the coffin. And this coffin, whenever Bani Israel would get into a war, they put it in front of them. And that's how they'll get the power and the strength. Miracle. It's the, 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 the box itself has no power. By the permission of Allah, it's working. And it only works for Bani Israel. For they put the box in front of them and they began. And this is on a Friday night. And the war begins. Bani Israel, the new generation, led by Yusha ibn Nun alayhi salam, fighting al Jabbarin on the doors of the promised land. Huge, intense fight is happening. It's Friday. And the sun is setting. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. The sun is setting. And what, well, if it sets, we're getting into what? What day? Saturday. They're not allowed to work on a Saturday. They can't do anything on a Saturday. And Yusha is fearing now. If we don't end this war by sunset, we're, uh, what's going to happen? We're going to have to retrieve, go back, wait for a day, and then continue the war. Maybe we've lost our motivation and our power and our strength, and maybe we get destroyed by the, by the tyrants, by the Jabbarin. So he makes a dua, oh Allah, hold the sun for us. Sahih Bukhari, when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that the sun was held for an hour for Yusha ibn Noon until he finished the war. They destroyed the Jabbarin. They ran out of the city, out of the promised land, and Bani Israel, congratulations, they were told now, enter the city, it's yours once again to reclaim. Who lived there? Ya'qub alayhi salam. This was his city. But then this is 460 years later, as the Mufassirun mentioned. Now once again, they've reclaimed their city. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He reveals and He sends down to them a commandment that as you enter the doors of Jerusalem, how should you enter? Tkhulul baba sujjadan. Go in while making ruku'ah. Sujjadan yani ruku'ah. This is different. In their sharia, the sujood was ruku'ah. A ruku'ah was sujood. Like Allah says about Dawood, فَخَرَّ رَاكِعًا وَأَنَابٍ مِنِنْ خَرَّ سَاجِدًا Anyway, 
Go in while in the state of Ruku'ah. Why? Because the doors that led into Bani Israel, the Mufassirun would say, were doors that you can, you, you can only enter in Ruku'ah. They're, they're, they're not tall. They're not like a heaven-sized door. They're a middle-sized door. So the only way you can enter is Ruku'ah. So what they did is they sat on their backside and they walked in yani, the opposite way. They, they went against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandment. There were about 20,000 of them. And Allah Azza wa Jal said to them, Qulu hitta. As you enter, say hitta, meaning, oh Allah, forgive our sins. I don't know, we're a tribe that killed prophets. And we went against Allah's commandment. We were vicious people. So Allah, forgive us our sins. Allah said, just say that and I'm ready to forgive your entire past. For, subhanallah, some of them made a mockery of that. Allah says, فَبَدَّلَ some of them, which were about 20,000 of them, as the Mufassirun mentioned, these are numbers are approximate, yani, uh, they said they changed, they exchanged the word. Allah said, say hitta. They said hinta, which means a, a, a wheat, a grain. Yeah, yeah, something ridiculous. What do you mean? They said hinta. So Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِجْزًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ بِمَا كَانُوا يَظْلِمُونَ He sent upon them from the heavens, from the sky, a punishment that came out of their skin and it ate them away and they died right then and there. In one hour of the day, 20,000 were dead. These are those who defined and made mockery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. <laughs> they want us to say, Hatta, Allah's going to forgive us. Is Allah making fun of us? And they made fun of Allah's maghfirah and that's how Allah destroyed them. Very first severe lesson that when one gives up hope in Allah's mercy or يعني, he turns the people away from Allah's mercy, as bad as their history was, nothing, nothing is going to get as bad as Bani Israel's history of killing prophets and worshipping a calf and going against Allah's commandments. So even then Allah Azza wa is ready to forgive them. They made a mock of Allah Azza wa mercy and forgiveness. He destroyed them right then and there. You know what's incredible in the ayah there? Allah Azza wa he says, Arsalna alayhim rijzam min as We sent a rijz, a punishment from the sky. And why from the sky? Allah could have sent it from anywhere. Why specifically did he say from the sky? Well, subhanAllah, this is beautiful. Why? Because the sky, what was it? For all that entire time in the desert, it was a source of mercy for them, wasn't it? That the cloud would hover above them, and the man was salwa was coming down from the sky. It was a source of mercy. So when Allah said, say hippa, and they exchanged the word for hippa, Allah exchanged the mercy that came down from the sky to a punishment. Uh, this is why he said, Wallahu alam min as That same sky was a source of mercy. I'm going to make it a source of punishment right now because of the exchange you did with my word that I gave you. For they were destroyed. Now Yusha ibn Nun enters and those, the believers of Bani Israel enter with him and they reclaim this city once again and it's theirs. MashaAllah, establishment of the deen, establishment of the commandment of Allah. At Torah is back in effect. This is the deen of Allah. Salat, wa ikhlas, wa worship, wa mashaAllah. Years go by and they begin to lose their faith. Now, Yusha, alayhi salam, long dead now. Prophets would come from time to time, they'd kill them. This is Bani Israel. Over time, they started losing their deen, started losing their ikhlas, their worship. Some of them went back onto shirk. No more Torah, no more upholding of the Torah, nothing. For once the faith began to drop bit by bit, as a punishment, Allah sends upon them another huge army called Al-Amaliq. And the king of Al-Amaliq, his name is Jalut. He'll come in the story. This guy was a, was a huge man. Al-Amaliq, they came in. This is what Allah does to a nation that lose their book and lose their commitment to the deen of Allah and lose their worship and their faith. That's exactly what happens. When they had their faith, everything was good. When they began to lose it, no, you don't, you don't deserve, Allah's not with you anymore. You don't deserve Allah's help. But Abu Ali came and above them the king, Jalut, and he begins to smash them left and right during the day, during the night, until he killed so many of them. He took their boys, the young boys, as slaves for them. He took the boys. They killed a lot of the women, a lot of the men, until there was one lady who was pregnant. And she was the wife of a prophet. So Bani Israel, they said, ah, this lady, 
We're supposed to take her. Maybe she gives birth to a prophet who maybe then can bring us back in here because we're no good. So let's take care of her. They run and they take her off the battlefield and they rush her to a safe place. They run away now from Palestine, from Jerusalem. They kicked out of the city and they run and they keep going down a few hundred kilometers until they reach what is now known as Jordan. That's where they settle now. And, this, and, and by the way, in that entire war, what happens? The box is stolen. Jalut and his army take the box. It's no longer with Bani Israel. They lost their box. If they lost their box, yeah, and everything's gone. The box is gone. And they go, and now they've settled in uh, Jerusalem, uh, humiliated. Uh, they got nothing of their deed. No Tawrab uh, in between them. Nothing at all. And of course, they're very sad that their relatives have died. Our children are gone. Most, for, first and foremost, our land is gone. We have nothing. Now we'll start a new life in a new land. And this woman, she began to make dua, Oh Allah, make what's in my belly a prophet. This is a way of Bani Israel, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, mentions it. And again, it doesn't go against our sharia. So we can mention this story as a story of Bani Israel. Uh, she's pregnant. Ya Allah, a prophet, she gives birth. Years go by. Oh, subhanallah, he becomes an appointed prophet. And his name is Samuel, alayhi salam. In the biblical version, his name is Samuel alayhi salam. He's mentioned in the Quran, but not by name. Now we get to the ayat of Surah uh, Al-Baqarah. You'll understand now. So Allah says, Alam tara ila al-mala min bani Israel, min ba'di Musa, if qalu li nabiyyin lahum, ib'ath lana malikan nukatil fi sabilillah. Allah Azza wa Jal now says to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Did you hear of the news of the chiefs of bani Israel? Musa, way after Musa. Now we're way after Musa. Remember, Musa had died 400 years ago. Min ba'di Musa. If qalu, these chiefs of Bani Israel, they said to Nabi Lahum, to a prophet of theirs. What's his name? Huh? Samuel alayhi salam. That's Nabi Lahum. Samuel alayhi salam. A prophet. They said to him, these are the chiefs, Mala, not everyone of Bani Israel. These are just the high rank. Those the ministers, yani, those that are around the king, those that are around the prophet and so on. They said, Ib'ath lana malikan nuqatil fi sabilillah. They said, eh, appoint for us a king so that we go and fight fi sabilillah. Wait, that's it. We're ready. We're ready to go back and we're ready to fight. But we need a king. Huwa, yani, why do you need a king? What's wrong with you people? Why can't you go? Well, this is the same thing that happens today. What happens today? People sit back. Where is Umar radiallahu anhu? Where is this and where is that? Well, what's wrong with us? Yani, don't we have anything yani, that we're able to hold on firm and, and go fight with? Anyway, this is the same sickness. It's right here. And this is Bani Israel. They're saying, appoint for us a king so we can fight. Fair enough. So this prophet, he knows Bani Israel. And he knows how they always rebel against Allah's commandments. So before he asks Allah to appoint for a king, he says to them, هَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالِ أَلَّا تُقَاتِلُوا He says, hey, Bani Israel, is there a possibility that if Allah was to command and make jihad fard upon us, that you won't fight for your Is that going to happen? Like a few hundred years ago? So they looked at this prophet with all seriousness. They said to him, wait, 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 you think we're joking? They said to him, وَمَا لَنَا أَلَّا نُقَاتِلَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَقَدْ أُخْرِجْنَا مِنْ دِيَارِنَا وَأَبْنَائِنَا They said, why won't we fight فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ When we have been kicked out of our land, وَأَبْنَائِنَا And our children have been taken. Of course we're ready. We're full of encouragement. We're full of motivation and strength and might and power and call or whatever it is. We're ready. Don't challenge us and don't make a mock of us. Ya Allah, point for us a king and we're on the way. All right. It sounds convincing. It sounds strong. For this king or this, this prophet, of course, is a prophet. He gets wahi. Allah reveals to this prophet, khalas, kutiba alayhim al qital. Well, a few days later, jihad has become an obligation upon them that they go and fight that Amalika that took their land. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, فَلَمَّا eventually, 
when the fighting kutiba alayhim al-qital, when it was ordained upon them and made fard upon them, this is what they requested. Look what happened. Tawallaw. <laughs> they ran away. Tawallaw meaning they all ran away. Illa qalilam minhum. Except a few of them. Uh, well, what's this? Subhanallah. Tawallaw. Al-ulama rahimahumullah, they say, except a few is 10%. They were 800,000. Just give or take. 800,000. 10% of that is 80,000. Yani how many left? Yani all of them. And what remained behind? 80,000. They're ready. Khalas, we're ready to go. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He says, Tawallaw. And look, I want you to be careful with these numbers. It started 800,000. Watch what it's going to end up to. The last number we're going to have is an authentic number in the hadith of Sahih al Bukhari. But uh, the numbers that we give now, they're a give and take that the ulama mentioned in the books of tafsir. Watch this. Very, very tough preparation. But the battle will be very easy at the end. So what happens? 80,000 now are serious. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Tawallaw illa qaleelan minhum, wallahu alimun bil-zalimeen. All of them ran away except a few, and Allah knows the wrongdoers. He knows. Yani all these that ran away, all wrongdoers. They're like their forefathers and generations that uh, yani refused to enter the promised lands before them. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعَثَ لَكُمْ قَالُوا مَلِكَ Didn't they, what did they ask for? They re- requested a king, right? So Allah wrote upon them al-jihad. Now what's the second thing they wanted? They wanted a king. So the Prophet says to them, okay, إِنَّ اللَّهَ Not me. He says, he specifically says, Allah بَعَثَ لَكُمْ He's appointed over you all. قالوت ملكا A man named Talut Who's Talut? Talut was a poor man Poor man He used to walk uh, يعني His work was سقي uh, الماء He's the one that used to go far in the desert Get the water from the wells And take it back to the village And give the people water And in other narrations He said his job used to That he used to tan the skin Treat the skin of dead animals And he would skin it And then make use of that That skin of the dead animal يعني poor He's got his wage, it's enough for him for the week. Uh, this prophet, he says, Alut, this man here, he's the king. He's going to lead you into Jerusalem. Oof. For they said to him, Qalu anna yakunu lahu al-mulku alayna. Hey, wait, wait. How can Talut have kingship over us? That doesn't make sense. And then they said to him, وَنَحْنُ They gave two reasons. Why? He can't be a king. Look, the Prophet is saying Allah has appointed him. Yeah, end of story. Allah, because Allah has appointed him. They're now defying and going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's appointment. So they say, well, then, how can he be a king over us? We have more right to being a king than him. And the other reason, He's a poor man. He's got no money. How can he be a king? Now you need to understand. What do they mean by we have more right being a king other than him? What do they mean by that? This is what they mean. Understand this. Bani Israel, when we say Bani Israel, what's the other name for Israel? What's the other name for Israel? Who's Israel? Huh? Ya'qub. Israel is Ya'qub. Bani Israel means Bani Ya'qub. Means the children of Yaqub. How many children did Yaqub have? Twelve. Remember the, the dream of Yusuf? He said, 11 stars and him, twelve. Okay. Ten of them came from one mother. And Yusuf and his brother Bin Yamin came from another mother. And this Talut is from the lineage of Bin Yamin. And in the twelve tribes of Bani Israel, the tribe that had the right to kinship, the kings used to come from a tribe called Yehuda, which is from the other mother. So they said, hey, Alut, he is from the lineage of Bin Yamin. How can he be a king? That tribe has nothing to do with kingdom. Kings come from us. That's one thing. We don't accept him. The other thing is poor man. He's got no money. How can he be a king? Father, what's the prophet going to say? He says again, Inna Allah Allah appointed him and selected him and chose you above all. Who cares now? 
What does it care? He's got money, he's got this. Mala, I'm telling you, a higher authority, Allah has appointed him for us. And istafahu comes from the word safa. Well, safa means purity. Now Allah has chosen because he's pure. He's right for the job. Inna Allah istafahu alaykum. And the other thing is, zadahu bastatan fil ilmi wal jism. And Allah has given him a wealth amount of knowledge. Ilm. He had knowledge. That's what made him different to everyone else. And as a king that is going to lead a nation, fi sabilillah, you need to have knowledge. Fiqh al-jihad, for example. What are you going to do? How are you going to disperse this army? How are you going to be victorious? How are you going to motivate and encourage this army of yours that eventually you're going to meet Jialut and his army? So a king needs knowledge. For Allah says, this guy has a lot of knowledge. Zadahu bastatan fil ilmi. And above all, wal jism. His body was big as well. He had strength, physical strength. That's what you need for a king. Not money. What's money going to do? What's money going to do? And what's lineage? Yeah, I came from here. Right? This is my dad. What's that going to do for you on a battlefield? On the battlefield, you need two things. You need knowledge to know how what to do. And you also need physical strength. And Qalut had that. And he was the perfect king. For Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Allah yu'ti mulkahu may yasha. And wait, yeah, now I don't have to explain this to you. Allah gives his kingdom to whoever he wants. Whether he had knowledge or nobody, or whatever it is, Allah gives his mulk to whoever he wants. Wallahu wasi'un alim. Then, Bani Israel didn't accept. So what happened? What do we have? 800,000? Went to 80,000? It's gone down to what? 8,000. 10%. 8,000. No good. No good. Before they left, they said to him, wait, if Talut is a king, show us a sign. Hey, show us something. Hey, ask Allah to show us a sign. So he said, all right. They said, that's the box of yours, that tabut, where is it? Where's that box? Where is it? Huh? It's still there with Jalut. It's stolen. He said, the sign that Jalut is a king, see that box that's lost? You're going to see it flying in the sky. Angels are going to carry it. For they're standing there. All of a sudden they look up and they see a flying box coming from a very far distance. It flies, it flies, it flies until it lands in front of Jalut. That's it. This is the sign. You asked for a sign. This is it. أحمله الملائكة إن في ذلك لآية لكم إن كنتم مؤمنين. If you really had iman, this is going to increase you in iman. But what happened? They ran away. No good. So we we had eighty thousand. They all saw the sign. A lot of them went, except ten percent of them. Eight thousand remained. Who oh, this is? What is it teaching you? And there are people, as Allah says, لا يؤمنون ولو جاءتهم كل آية. Even if you bring the يعني, ayat, millions and millions and millions of signs after, after one another, they still won't believe. خلاص, once inside is finished, destroyed, well, like you see a million signs, you'll never believe anything. خلاص, they're gone, and now we have 8,000. All right, these are 8,000, they're ready. Alut is ready to go. He stands outside the outskirts of Jordan, wherever they are, and he says to the people, Allah, get ready, we're going. 8,000, they're ready, they come, they pack, they, يعني, they, they've, they've made themselves ready with their armor and their military, whatever it is, and they go outside and they begin to march. خلاص. Now, Balut, with approximately 8,000, after 800,000, he's going towards Bayt al Maqdis, the promised land. As they're walking, Balut knew something, but he kept it hidden from them. And he knew this thing via the Prophet. What is this thing? Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ بِالْجُنُودِ فَصَلَ," meaning when Talut organized the army and began to march with the army. Now he's leaving. He's heading towards his mission. He said to the people after he left, "Look, إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُبْتَلِيكُمْ بِنَهَرٍ." As we go towards Jerusalem, there's going to be a river. And Allah, that river is going to be a big fitna for us. Allah's made it a test. 
What's the fitna? فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي I know you're all going to be thirsty. But whoever drinks from it has failed the test, he's got to go back. No more, he can't join us. The only exception is if you drink one handful. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَطْعَمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْ إِلَّا مَنْ اغْتَرَثَ غُرْفَةً بِيَدِهِ That's all. Now you're going to be really thirsty. You've got to control yourself. What is he teaching them? Patience. And if you can't be patient on a river, how are you going to be patient when you go in front of Jalut and see Jalut? What's going to happen to you? So you got to prove to Allah your patience right now on a river. If you can't do it here, then you're no good. Go back. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, فَشَرِبُوا مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُ They all drank, except a few. Just like the same words in the beginning of the story. What's except a few? Yani 10%. 8,000, what are we down to? What are we down to? 800. 800. Sharibu. They saw it. MashaAllah. Water. Is it cold? We're thirsty. Bismillah. One, two, three, four. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says something very incredible. He says, those who drank more than a handful weren't satisfied. They, 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 yani, it, it didn't fill them. And those who drank one handful... Allah made it satisfactory for them bi-ithnillah. Alhamdulillah, they needed no more to drink. Or, yani, what you learn from that, my brothers and sisters, is that when one pursues after the haram, he, you'll never be satisfied. Yani, look, the one billah, that, that commits zina. One zina is enough for him? Wallah, it's not enough for him. Two is enough? Wallah, not two is enough. Two hundred, three, I mean, it keeps going forever and it's never enough. Meanwhile, the one... Yani, who took by the halal and by what Allah made for him permissible and he married Islamically, that's satisfactory for him until he dies. Who the barakah is in what Allah Azzawajal makes halal. Look at the people that do riba, mathala. One dollar of riba is not enough for them. They'll keep eating and keep eating and keep eating and he'll never ever be satisfied. He's got billions in the bank but he's never satisfied. And the one who earns his money through halal, Allah, ten dollars is enough for him. Uh, $500 in the week is enough for him. Heather, this is the test Allah Azza wa is teaching now. He's saying, إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُمْ Those who failed and kept drinking, all of they weren't satisfied and, Ya Allah, turn back, I don't want you with me. You're going to destroy the entire yeah, motivation of the army. Get out of here. So they went back. He's got now, how many? 800. He's got 800. Allah says, فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَهُ When he passed the river, on the other side now. They're getting really, really close now to uh, Bani Israel. They're getting really close to Jalut and the army, to the promised land. فَلَمَّا جَوَزَ هُوَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ Allah calls the mu'mineen now. These people that came with him, they, they passed the test. هُوَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ They walk, they walk. Allahu Akbar. They get in front of Jalut and his army. Jalut and his army, they're about, يعني, it's mentioned about 100,000. 800. As soon as they saw this sight, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says that people said, قالوا, لا طاقة لنا اليوم بجالوت وجنوده. No way. This is impossible. How many now remained with Qalut? Al Hadith al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, عن البراء بن عازب رضي الله عنه صحيح البخاري. He said that we counted the men that remained with Qalut to be the exact number of men that were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the Battle of Badr. How many were in the Battle of Badr? 313. From 800, now we're 313. That's it. These are with Qalut. They remained steadfast. They didn't shake. They didn't look left and right. Allahu Akbar. What are we going to do? Look at Jalut. Jalut is a monster Jalut. And his army, they're even scarier. And 80,000 or 100,000 of them, no way. Look at the other side, 313. And the Jalut flicks them like that, he'll kill them. They're very difficult now. But now to understand that it's never, ever, ever about the numbers and about this and that. Look what Allah Azza wa says. قَالَ الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُ اللَّهِ Oh, this is a powerful ayah. These 313, Allah describes them as يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُ الله. What does that mean? That means those who were certain that they will meet Allah said. Certainty. And Allah now praises them with the quality of certainty. These people are certain they're going to meet Allah. 
Yani they're certain in the hereafter. Yani there's iman. What did they say to each other? They looked at each other. What motivation did they give each other? They said to each other, كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلًا غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Hey, no worries. How many, how many small groups defeated large groups? And the key was بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ By the permission of Allah. وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ Allah is with the patient. And don't forget, we're all patient. Huh? We're all patient. Because we, we pass the test in the river. For we're patient. And Allah is with the patient. So relax. They, they're motivating each other. Oh, no, they're scared, but they're motivating each other. Another beautiful meaning to this, يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُ اللَّهِ What does يَظُنُّونَ mean? Huh? Ali, ظن. What does ظن mean? To assume. To assume. And how did I translate it? To be certain. Van means to be certain. And its raw, natural meaning means to assume. What does that mean? If we read, those who assume they will meet Allah said, what does that mean? This has got a beautiful meaning. You know, salam rahmatullah, on the battlefield, what can happen? There's only two things that can happen on a battlefield. What can happen? Victory or martyrdom, shahada, or either you die or victorious. Allah Azza wa is saying those who assume they will meet Allah. Meaning what did they assume? They assumed martyrdom. They thought we're gone, we're going to die. And you know, the one who assumes martyrdom and he's fighting in the intention he's going to die, what kind of fighting would he fight? How sincere would it be? How pure would it be? This is why those who remained with Talut are the pure of the pure. They're the ones Allah wants. That's why they made it all the way. They're people that are going to fight with the intention of halla. In this one hour, we're going to die. We're going to meet Allah. We imagine that. Can you imagine into you are fighting for the sake of Allah with the intention, I'm going to die now. How sincere would your fighting be? How much for Allah Azzawajal's sake is it going to be? Incredible stuff. For, for this is them. Allah Azzawajal is describing us to them. That he's describing them for us. That these people were at the nth degree of sincerity. They're ready. كم من فئة قليلة غلبت فئة كثيرة بإذن الله والله مع الصابرين. ولما برزوا لجالوت وجنوده. Huh? Now برزوا. Jalut and his army are right there, and 313 of them with Talut are right here. And by the way, from the very beginning, there's a young boy with them. I'll tell you who that young boy is. He's got no mention until the end. Young boy. I guess they say he was 16 years old. Young boy with the army. And subhanAllah, he's passed everything and he's made it all the way with the 313. They stopped and they made a dua. They said, They're already sabirin. Allah has already called them sabirin. But they understand that we need more sabr. This is not going to be easy. And not just give us sabr. Pour upon us sabr. We need buckets and buckets of it. Pour, afrigh, pour upon a sabr. وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا And keep our foot firm in the earth. Ah, make sure you don't uh, make our hearts shake and then we turn away. Make our, uh, our foot firm in the earth that we only meet this army. ثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ And give us victory against Talut and his army, these kafirin, these people. So very important. Look at the dua and how important the dua is for victory. They're on the battlefield. Allah has already praised them. Well, they're going to be victorious. But they find the need of the dua. This is exactly the same dua that who makes? The Sahaba. In the war of Uhud. Can you see how this story was an inspiration for the Sahaba? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum in Uhud. This is the second, because they lost the first round. On the second round, they look at each other. And they say, رَبَّنَا ثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ These same words. وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِ فَآتَاهُمُ الله. Then Allah gave him victory. Look what happened in the story. For the Sahaba got the inspiration from here, from this story. وَصُورَةَ الْبَقَرَةَ is a madani surah. And this came just before غَزْوَةَ uh, الْأَحْزَابِ فَالدُّعَاءَ The dua always for, for victory is very important. They make this dua. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, as a result of this dua, fa. Fa means as a result. Yani, what's the thing that brought them victory? This dua. فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ they, dis- they crushed them by the permission of Allah. And uh, this word is incredible. هَزَمُوهُمْ 
At the beginning, when they gave motivation to each other, what did they say? كَمْ مِنْ فِعَةٍ قَلِيلًا what? غَلَبَتْ Allah did not say here, فَغَلَبُوهُمْ They defeated them. No. He said, فَهَزَمُوهُمْ هَزَمُوهُمْ comes from the word hazm. And hazm, literally, is to grab a dry leaf and to crush it. And then, it's gone. يَعْنِ فَهَزَمُوهُمْ They crushed them. بِإِذْنِ Oh, that was the key. By the permission of Allah. Otherwise, if you look at it, 100,000 here, 330, no way. But only by the permission of Allah. فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ الله. Now, they crushed them. But before they crushed them, what happened? You see, in the, in the past, it's different to today. They used to bring one fighter from one army and another fighter from the other army. And they do something called the mubaraza. They would fight each other. This was kind of like it gives motivation and it pumps up the wall. And this even happened in the Battle of Badr. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi took out three and the Quraysh took out three and they fought each other. This is happening here. From Jalut's side, who came out? Jalut. He came out. You look how scary that is. Yeah, this is the big boss. Huge. And he's got armor from top to bottom. He's fully armored. Metal. Why are you going to kill this guy? Fatalut. He looks around at his army. And he says, who's ready to go and challenge uh, Jalut? Uh, no one responds. But there's a young boy. He says, Anna, I'll go for it. He says, Inta, you're too young. Someone else. He says, I'll go. Ami then Palut says, all right, listen. Who goes and fights Jalut, I will marry him off to my daughter and I'll give him the kingdom. Because he's a king, Jalut. I'll give him the kingdom after me. He'll inherit it after me. Allah, this boy says, I'll go. I mean, what skills do you have? He says, and who's this boy? Dawood. Dawood, alayhi salam, later on. He's not a prophet yet. He's still a boy. He says, I've got a skill. And I'm a shepherd. And I know how to use the slingshot. He says, how do you know how to use it? He said, once a dog came to my sheep and I killed him. And another time a lion came to my sheep and I killed him. He said, go. So he went. Ujailut saw it. He said, that you. He said, go back. Go get me someone else. You're too young. He said, no, no, I'm ready. And he's got his slingshot. And he, this is the old, not this one, the old one. He turns it around. Huh? Palestinian, right? MashaAllah, they still use it until today. And he goes like this. Oh, MashaAllah, he releases it. And it goes right, it travels, it travels until it hits Jalut right here. It goes in. Allah says, وَقَتَلَ دَاوُودُ جَالُوت He died. He killed him right then and there. And this is our king. He just died. This is why the story is called a stone. The stone of victory. This is the stone. It dropped him. And if your king is dead, who's going to khalas? They all ran away. And they came after him. MashaAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal gave them that victory. فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَقَتَلَ دَاوُودُ جَالُوت وَآتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَعَلَّمَهُ مِمَّا يَشَاءُ طبعا years went by وداود عليه السلام he got married to the daughter of Qalut and Qalut when he died داود عليه السلام became a king and Allah says that Allah gave الملك to داود and الحكمة الحكمة is prophet prophethood in other words, the first man in Bani Israel to be a king and a prophet at the same time was Dawood alayhi salam. No one before that was a king and a prophet. He was the first one. وَآتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Meaning prophethood. وَعَلَّمَهُ مِمَّا يَشَاءُ Wallah gave him knowledge. Knowledge. وَعَلَّمَهُ مِمَّا يَشَاءُ Dawood alayhi salam had a lot of knowledge. He knew how to, يعني, uh, he was the first one to make the body vest. The armor, you know those rings, how they wear them on, on, as, a, as a body vest in the, in the wall. Uh, Allah mentions a lot of things in the Quran in terms of what he taught Dawood alayhi salam. And then Allah says as a commentary at the end, And hadn't it been for the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal from time to time sends a small group of righteous, sincere believers to destroy a huge, rebellious, corrupt army, لَفَسَدَتِ الْأَرْضِ The earth would have been full of corruption. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ Yani Allah is teaching us. From time to time, there will exist 
a small group. Victory will be on their hand. And this small group would stop oppression on earth. And this is the sunnah of Allah and continues until the day of judgment. It doesn't stop. We don't look at our times and say, where's this small group? It exists. But they've got to go through all of that first. Through all of that. Because we don't want a lot of them. There should be a few, a small number. When Nabi Sallallahu says in the hadith, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي There's still a طائفة. يعني شو طائفة؟ يعني طائفة like a family. Meaning small in number. A small group. There still remains a small group. على الحق, upon the truth. لا يضرهم من خذنهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم كذلك وهم على ذلك يعني until the command of Allah of victory comes and it will be on their hands فأنا what's incredible in this story سبحان الله is the topic is جالوت وطالوت and at the end the victory is on a young boy داود out of nowhere he came out of nowhere his mention comes at the end هنا الله عز وجل سبحان الله is teaching us that who knows maybe it's someone young among us that Allah Azza wa Jal makes victory on his hand. Never lose the hope. Could be someone young. Wallahu a'lam who it is. This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would always take extra care with the young boys of the Muhajirun or the Ansar. Always take a lot of care. Then the future is on their hand. This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the hadith of the seven that he shades in his shade on the day of judgment in which there is no shade except his. What were the first two? Ah, in order of the hadith, the seven categories. What? Just ruler? What's the second one? Young boy, nurtured on the deen of Allah. And then the other five. Why are these the first two? Why are they the first two? Why, why wasn't the others were mentioned first? There's a secret in the order that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions it. It's not just like that. Oh, there's, there's something in it. لأن the, the just ruler and a young boy that is nurtured on the deen of Allah, they can change the world. Different to all the others. They're, all the others are righteous for themselves. These two categories, if they properly did yani, just rule, yani, imagine a just ruler. What kind of change can he bring on the world? No oh, way, just one just ruler. He'll, he'll, yani, he'll bring, subhanAllah, justice on the earth. He'll, he'll make a huge change on the earth. And, uh, and imagine you had a boy that was raised on the deen of Allah. Do you know what kind of change he does? Like the boy of the story of the ditch, Ghulam al Ukhdud. The entire community becomes Muslim on his hand. His legacy becomes something Allah mentions in the Quran, Surah al buruj That's the power of a young boy. And then even in this story we saw, Dawood, who is Dawood? He came at the end of the story. But he's been in the making, he's preparing. Shabu nasha fi ta'atillah. This is Dawood alayhi salam. You know, Dawood. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi even teaches us. The best fasting was the fasting of Dawood. One day on, one day off. On the best night prayer was the night prayer of Dawood. MashaAllah. Who was Dawood? Shabun nasha fi ta'atillah. That's who Dawood was. From the very beginning, he was pious and righteous. Allah Azza wa prepared him and wanted victory on his hand. He's the one who killed Jalut. And he was given al-mulk wal-hikmah. SubhanAllah. The last comment Allah Azza wa makes in this uh, ayah, in the surah, very remarkable. He says, Tilka ayatullah. Natluha alayka bil haqq. Wa innaka lamin al-mursaleen. He says, these are the ayat of Allah. We narrate unto you bilhaq. Shuyani bilhaq. What does that mean? Bilhaq. With truth, and it has one more meaning, with purpose. Haq means truth and purpose. Meaning these are the ayat of Allah. Allah is saying, I narrate unto you with truth and with purpose as well. There's a purpose for them. You know, just yani, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a purpose for the stories. Yeah, Allah is telling us they're for a purpose. And the last beautiful thing, وَإِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And you are from among those who are sent. Why did he say that? This surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, is being revealed where? In Medina. Oh, Medina and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who does he interact with more? The Jews. The Jews. Serious interaction with the Jews happened when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived to Medina. Well, the Jews, Bani Israel, they know this story. They say, uh, this is a story of Bani Israel, Samuel, Qarut, Jalut, and Dawood. This is, this is for us. It belongs to us. This is from our legacy. For Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions the story. Like, to prove to the Jews, إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ like, no, and the, the Jews, when they heard Rasulullah say this story, what? Where did He get this from? How did He know the exact details of this story, of the tabut, of the coffin, what's in it, what's the prophet, 
who came to him, uh, Palut was appointed, they refused, then they accepted, then there was a river, they drank, they didn't drink, then they walked in, then... Now where did he get all this from? He's an Arab, and he has no Jewish or Christian friends. So there is no, the, no possibility that someone leaked in some information to him. That didn't happen. So where did he get it from? So Allah says that the Jews understand. Tilka ayatullah. This is the ayat of Allah. Natluha alayka bil haqq. Wa innaka la min al mursaleen. Isn't it enough for you Jews that this is enough proof that he's min al mursaleen? He's from the Prophet. For this is how Allah Azza wa Jal proved once again to the Jews that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is indeed a Prophet from Allah. For how did he get the information of Qalut Ujailu? It can only be through one channel. And that is the channel of wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fa'allahu alam, this is the end of the story. <laughs>